Good morning, everyone. It's Sunday, August the 12th, 2018. I hope everyone's having a beautiful day in the Lord. Um, I have a couple of devotionals for you today. And uh, before I get started, I, like always, I would like to say the Our Father. So please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, uh, this is called uh, Worship. And the reading is from uh, Genesis 12, 8, and it says, He moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Worship is giving God the best that he has given to you. Be careful what you do with the best that you have. Whenever you get a blessing from God, give it back to him as a love gift. Take time to meditate before God and offer the blessing back to him in a deliberate act of worship. Now, don't think that a deliberate act of worship is trying to score brownie points with the Lord or doing work for your salvation. No, this is the relationship that you have with the Lord that you're giving back to him in the relationship as a deliberate act of worship because you love him. Okay, um, if you hoard it, for yourself, it will turn into spiritual dry rot, as manna did when it was hoarded. And you could read that in Exodus 16, 20. God will never allow you to keep a spiritual blessing completely for yourself. It must be given back to him so that he can make it a blessing to others. So if, um, you know, you want to give back to the Lord and you want to come on to YouTube and, um, you know, you know, uh, read some scripture or you want to minister to others, uh, make sure that the intent behind the delivery of that deliberate worship is not to compete with someone else on YouTube or to bring glory to yourself. Uh, or to achieve some kind of fame for yourself, or to have people look at you, okay? Make sure it's a deliberate act of worship to the Lord. Make sure and ask the Lord to search your intention of all things that you do. Bethel is the symbol of fellowship with God. I is, which is A-I, is the symbol of the world. Abraham pitched his tent between the two. And there's that pitching of the tent again. Okay. The last value of our public service for God is measured by the depth of the intimacy of our private times of fellowship and oneness with him. Yeah. That's right. Rushing in and out of worship is wrong every single time. There is always plenty of time to worship God. Days are set apart. Quiet can be a trap. Okay. Days set apart for quiet can be a trap. Distracting from the need to have daily quiet time with God. 
That is why we must pitch our tent where we will always have quiet times with him, however noisy our times with the world may be. There is not there are not three levels of spiritual life, worship, waiting, and work. Yet some of us seem to jump like spiritual frogs from worship to waiting and from waiting to work. God's idea is that the three should go together as one. They were always together in the life of our Lord and in perfect harmony. It is a discipline that must be developed. It will not happen overnight. Dig in and pursue it. And this one is called Intimate with Jesus. And the reading is from John 14, 9, and it says, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Hmm. How many of you have realized years and years and years after living with someone in your family, uh, like a sibling or an in-law or somebody that's known you since you were little and then they throw false accusations at you or they don't understand what you're saying uh, or what you're doing and you say to yourself well how could somebody spend so much time with me and not know who I am these words were not spoken as a rebuke, nor even with surprise. Jesus was encouraging Philip to draw closer. Yet the last person we get intimate with is Jesus. Before Pentecost, the disciples knew Jesus as the one who gave them power to conquer demons and to bring about revival. You could read about that in Luke 10, 18, 20. It was a wonderful intimacy, but there was much a much closer intimacy to come. I have called you friends in John 15, 15, Jesus said. True friendship is rare on earth. It means identifying with someone in thought, heart, and spirit. The whole experience of life is designed to enable us to enter into this close relationship with Jesus Christ. We receive his blessings and know his word, but do we really know him? Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. John 16, 7. He left that relationship to lead them even closer. It is a joy to Jesus when a disciple takes time to walk more intimately with him. The, the bearing of fruit is always shown in scripture to be the visible result of an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And you could see that in John 15, 1, 4. Once we get intimate with Jesus, we are never lonely and we never lack for understanding or compassion. We can continually pour out our hearts to him without being perceived as overly emotional or pitiful. Yeah, you never have to worry about him calling you an emotional basket case or uh, an emotional beggar, you know. He understands the human emotion. And he will stabilize you. I guarantee that. The Christian who is truly intimate with Jesus will never draw attention to himself, but will only show the evidence of life where Jesus is completely in control. This is the outcome of allowing Jesus to satisfy every area of life to its depth. The picture resulting from such a life that of the strong calm balance that the Lord gives to those who are intimate with him and I could testify to that you know a lot of times when I'm reading scripture or I'm trying to make a point 
the only thing I could offer you is um, a test a testimony of something that I've experienced in my own walk with Jesus uh, and to use it as an analogy so that you understand it I was just contemplating the other day something and here it is popping up in this um, devotional uh, which I'm going to take as a confirmation um, when you backslide or when you're not born again and you embrace the sin in your life or make an excuse for that sin um, you may think that you belong to Jesus but you really have given yourself over to the devil and anyone who's been in an addiction or trapped by Satan has felt their life uh, been slowly sucked under and away from them and um, as you go deeper and deeper into the arms and octopus tentacles of Satan and you start to suffocate you start to believe that you have no more power or control anymore over your life you your will has weakened to the point where you say to yourself, uh, why even try? I can't even get a leg up, you see? And when you get to that point, many times it's so scary to see that you've relinquished all your power and control to the devil. The only way to look is towards Jesus Christ. That's why he's the Savior. He is the only one that can pull you out. And when you belong to Jesus and you get closer and closer in your intimate walk with him, a very similar thing happens, uh, but for good. And um, you realize that, like I've said in another video, you may be able to decide uh, what flavor of ice cream to buy when you go get an ice cream cone. But most of the other decisions in your life, if your flesh should rise up and decide, des desire you to do something uh, at some point in your intimate walk as you become more and more intimate with the Lord you won't even be able to go outside of your intimate relationship and you won't even be able to even consider the flesh and sometimes when you reach that point your flesh will panic because you've also realized that when you go the other way you have also relinquished all of your independence so there's only two ways to serve okay people in marriages have given their allegiance to each other on the altar and have turned their backs on those marriages and broken the vows that they proclaim to each other in front of our Heavenly Father. Same with people that have come to Christ for their salvation. They've made a, they made a commitment to the Father to serve Him. And then they turned their back and divorced Him and turned back to Satan. And if you even if you do that, uh, you are going to get, you'll be embraced by those tentacles. There's only two ways to go in this world, people. And once you realize that, okay, and you permit the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ in spirit, our Heavenly Father in spirit, okay, you won't resist it because it's for your own good because even as children when our parents discipline us however painful that might be to want to do the things that we want to do as little and cute as we are as children our parents know better they know the right way and when that tantrum passes 
all the feelings of being restricted and confined will pass and dissipate and um, you'll be less focused on the narcissism of Satan and the rebellious nature of the flesh which is born into all of us. Difficult lessons, but precious jewels they are. And I hope you enjoyed these devotionals today. I love to bring them to you, along with my own personal experiences. And I want to say and remind you that I love you. Jesus loves you. Never forget how much he loves you. He's coming very, very soon. So keep looking up.